So welcome everybody and we'll continue to let folks in as they get on. Uh, this is part of a monthly series that the Fellowship of Reconciliation is doing called Gathering Voices, where we speak to faith and justice and activists and leaders, um, our prophetic voices that uh, we call upon to inspire us and to guide us in our in our work for um, a more peaceful and a more just world. And this is the second in this series. Uh, last month, we hosted uh, Dr. James Sogby, president of the Arab American Institute. And today I'll be speaking with Reverend Graylin Scott Hagler. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and start to introduce him. And um, I'm going to do this introduction rather than um, reading you Graylin's bio or speaking Graylin's bio, because I want to tell that story with him. I'm going to introduce him with how I came to know uh, Reverend Hagler which is, it, it's, it's a story. So um, in 2015, 2016, I, I live in, uh, my hometown is Ithaca, New York, in upstate New York. And I was part of the local Jewish Voice for Peace chapter. And we started getting notices from uh, the National Jewish Voice for Peace um, organization about Reverend Hagler. And Reverend Hagler had taken um, a group of clergy to the West Bank, to Palestine, to see for themselves with their own eyes the apartheid and the crimes against humanity taking place on the ground. And Reverend Hagler got back and rather than being applauded for this um, act to, to spread justice and to um, allow people to know what's going on with our tax dollars and our political support. So rather than being um, uh, applauded for that, he had events canceled and received death threats. So as local Jewish Voice for Peace chapters, uh, we were called on um, all of the Jewish Voice for Peace chapters to raise our voices in support of the incredible work that Reverend Hagler was doing. And we'll get to the, more into this conversation. Um, but uh, so as he was dealing with event cancellations and, and death threats for speaking truth to power and calling for the liberation of the Palestinian people uh, in, in accordance with all of our faiths, faith traditions, um, we brought him to Ithaca as, as a guest to, to speak to our community. And uh, I believe it was called from Detroit to Palestine, connecting the dots. And what, Im what impressed me so much was the way he held his dignity in the face of um, such hideous, hideous attacks. And it was just such a, such a powerful, he had such a powerful voice but just a sense of presence as um, he maintained his his truth and his prophetic voice, and um, I was just have been a fan ever since. So um, when I came on as executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, uh, Graylin was one of the first people that I reached out to. Um, he has been at the United Church of Christ in, in Washington, D.C., and I've also heard him preach there. But so he was one of the first people I reached out to and said, will you sit down with me and and talk about this this work and this journey that I'm embarking on um, as executive director of the Fellowship of Reconciliation? And that led to a partnership and Graylin coming on the FOR team as an advisor. And I just couldn't be more excited uh, to have you on, Graylin. So welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Such those words. To have you on. And um, I want to kind of tell the story of, of how you came to be where you are now, how you came into this work. So um, if you could start with uh, where you grew up. And well, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, in the city, went to public schools there. And um, and and really sort of going to public schools in Baltimore at the time I did, you clearly saw the discrimination. Uh, 
uh, the racism that was apparent because it was after DSEG. But um, but um, the answer to that was that uh, all doing your elementary education and only in the first year of your junior high education were the teachers black. And then it switched over to all white teachers and all black student bodies. And those teachers kept the doors locked because they were afraid of the student body. Uh, and that began to sort of begin to increase and in some of my awareness about the way um, that I was going to be treated in this world. Uh, and I always say to folks, the first riot I saw and was uh, and was not the riot of 1968 after Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was killed. But there was a riot earlier in 1965 in Baltimore, which was a Klan riot because the Klan used to uh, burn their cross in the park outside the steel mill where my father worked and they would serve kegs of beer uh, to, to whites who were getting off. And that was the first uh, riot I actually saw, which was the Klan. Uh, and so, you know, it just heightened my awareness of all of these types of things that I was going to be facing uh, and, and people like me were going to be facing the rest of our lives. And I think we're very much back in... Uh, that moment, not not to say that we left that moment, but I think we're in a, a very u- unique um, and dangerous, a very dangerous moment right now as a world, right, as we watch fascism um, come into power in Italy and rise in Sweden and France, and we still, you know, we're teetering on the brink. Um, right. What what led you to, to ministry? Well, that's a very interesting story because I didn't grow up in church. I didn't go to church. Uh, um, there were a couple times that I went to church with relatives or something, but 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 other than that, didn't go didn't go to church until seminary. So I went through four years of college and didn't go to church. Went to high school and m- middle school and elementary school. Didn't go to church, and I went to church when I went to seminary. Uh, but it was something that I knew that I was called to do. There's a text in Jeremiah that says, uh, uh, I knew you when you were in your mother's womb. And, and, and basically, I felt that I was called from before I was cognizant of the fact that I was called. Because when I went into college, the first thing I said is I was a religion major. Uh, and I remember the counselor saying, no, no, it's too soon to declare that you're a religion major. Look around, see what else you like. I said, no, that's the only reason I'm here. And uh, and so I left one school because of their of, they didn't have a religion department. They just gotten rid of it. And uh, and so then I ended up uh, leaving that college and ending up in Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio, that had a very strong religion department. And then from there to Chicago Theological Seminary. But it was an awareness. It was a deep spiritual awareness that existed within me that was not cultivated in church. And I give thanks to God that it wasn't cultivated in church because if it was cultivated in church. I'd be looking at things through a reactionary lens rather than a lens of liberation. So I give thanks to God that I was outside before I was called inside. Mm. Well, you, you, I certainly agree that you, you've had that voice from the start because, you know, when I speak it, when I hear you speak, it is that, that liberation voice that, comes through and and rings so strong. I really like uh, the story of what you established in Boston and you know how you began to work with the most disempowered, right communities and chose that um, for your ministry. If you could tell us about that. Sure. I ended up in leaving Chicago and heading to Boston, literally got run out of Chicago. Uh, I'm just sort of admitting those facts. And when I say run out of Chicago, I was very doing a lot of organizing in Chicago Uh, and um, was arrested one Saturday afternoon, coming out of the loop, held for three hours. Uh, The police didn't charge me with anything. I was not given a ticket. Three hours later, I was released. And my car had not been impounded, so I walked back and found my car. And I drove to the church just as the fire department was rolling up the hose. They had set the church on fire, and they wanted clearly wanted me to make the connection that the church, that the fire at the church was not an accident, but it was a deliberate um, <clears throat> uh, arson. So at that point, I knew that my tenure in Chicago was pretty uh, was pretty much at, at an end. Um, I, I was ministering not too far from where 
uh, Fred Hampton had been killed. And so there was still the remnants of the Chicago Red Squad that was still active. And and so uh, that was a part of it. And one of the things that they were on me about is because I had become the pastor to uh, a group of Puerto Ricans on the uh, northwest side of Chicago that was the part of the Puerto Rican independence movement. And after I'd become their pastor, they ended up on the FBI's 10, 10 most wanted list. And so uh, somebody knew that, I, somebody felt that I knew the whereabouts of the people on the list. So when I left Chicago, I ended up in Boston. And we began to look at organizing in Boston. One of the reasons I went to Boston, not because I had a job, because I drove taxi cab to support the work I was doing. Uh, and uh, I drove taxi cab deliberately because that was something that gave me the freedom to organize in the city and to do what I needed to do in order to put whatever God was going to lay before me together in that city. And uh, <clears throat> I settled in Roxbury, Roxbury, Massachusetts. And uh, we began to organized uh, there and uh, took over a building that had been a shooting gallery uh, for for years. And we just basically squatted on top of the squatters in the shooting gallery and started holding worship services and organizing out of there. Come to find out it was a city-owned building. Uh, but uh, we began to organize from that building into the whole surrounding neighborhood and the city. We were, we were blessed with interns like Christopher Nye, who's on this on this call today. He, he was up with us for a year as we were doing all of that work. Uh, but that work led to the kinds of issues that were before us around uh, uh, around racial violence that was being carried on. There were arbitrary attacks that were being carried on against families that would go to uh, get ice cream on a Sunday afternoon. And, um, and so we began to organize around those types of things, which led to uh, really organizing around the generally racial justice. Uh, and we were blessed, um, uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to tell this story in this way. We were blessed when we organized the church in the building there out of Dudley Station. We were blessed to be robbed by one of our church members of all the church funds. <laughs> now, I'm going to say it that way. Explain how you were blessed to be robbed, because I know there's I know there's an explanation there. Sure, I, I was I was furious at the time, uh, you know. But uh, it was somebody who had shouldered, worked alongside me, who was addicted, and nobody knew he was addicted. And so the first chance he got, I was out of town. He embezzled all the money from the church, and shot it up in cocaine. Mm -hmm. And um, when we finally caught up with him, you know, I was mad as can be. I wasn't. I wasn't a peaceful, mellow guy in those days. And so uh, so we had a major confrontation uh, at his home when he got home. And uh, and so one of the things that happened was that he called me a few hours later after we had that confrontation and said, I need for you to get me into treatment. Mm -hmm. And I said, but you, you're not going to stick because he was an older person. He had shot found out for over 40 years and said, it's not going to work. Da, 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 da. So he pledged to me that it would work. And so we got him in the only Spanish speaking drug treatment program in New England, which was in Dorchester. And they did everything to try to make him quit, to frustrate the daylights out of him. And, and that's when six months down the road, I began to realize that this guy was serious in his pledge, yeah. uh, that he was not going to quit. He was not going to give up. So when he came out of the program, he agreed to make restitution to the church voluntarily uh, and then began to recruit people out of the recovery halls because there was no drug treatment uh, meetings whatsoever in Roxbury. And so we ended up with hundreds of women and men uh, in, in the church building every single day because the money was stolen. Uh, that's why I say what, when the money was stolen, we were blessed. We were blessed with a whole new ministry that was born out of uh, really hurt and pain and addiction uh, to really become a place of recovery and hope uh, and solidarity with one another. And so that became a pretty much a base that began to uh, move us into dealing with cops on stop and frisk, because uh, that was going on in the neighborhood. And in that, I don't know when you were there, Chris, I can't remember the date, but there was a there was a man who killed his wife and uh, he, they were in birthing class down at Brigham and women's hospital. And, uh, and he 
drove his wife down into the Mission Hill Projects, which is a part of Roxbury, and he killed him and said a black man had hijacked their car and had carjacked them. And uh, and basically the police and the mayor went into overdrive, tearing up the city. And we were right in the middle of it uh, because that's where we were. And I knew at that point that all of the folks in our church, in our drug program were in trouble because they were going to be harassed. Or they were going to be preyed upon by the cops who had gone absolutely crazy. But the other side of that, I, I'll never forget, because I took a contrarian position and got in some trouble at the time because I didn't fully believe in the story. And I'm going to tell you why I didn't believe in the story. It's not because I was smart. <laughs> because the, the folks gathered before their meeting every day, which the meeting was at 12 noon. They gathered every day before their meeting, and then they talked about the events of the day. And this particular day, they were all lamenting over the shooting that had happened uh, and basically being predominantly people of color, predominantly black folks, they began to blame themselves uh, for the killing saying, see, we got this animalistic nature in us and on and on and stuff like that, that was really sort of just really uh, demeaning to, um, to the community. And then there was another leader in the church who was also independent spirit, contrary and to a lot of the times in recovery. And he says, y'all, the husband killed him. And everybody jumped on him. His name was George Kenny. I, you know, everybody jumped on him and told him that he was crazy, that he couldn't face the truth and on and on. And so when they all went to the meeting, George was lagging behind. And I said, George, why'd you say that? And George says, Rev, you know me. I was a stick up artist. <laughs> he says, you shoot the man and control the situation. You don't shoot the woman. And he says, and if you go to that intersection, there's five streets coming into that intersection. And you're going to tell me out of five streets coming into an intersection at rush hour, nobody saw the carjacking. He said the husband killed her. That's what caused me to step out in the position that I maintained until it was proven that the husband had killed her. So that was part of the journey in Roxbury as we continue to do that ministry up there. Um, and I need to say this, you know, we ended up, we were blessed. We had the African National Congress at the church and in the church, we had um, the uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine in and around the church. Um, we had, the, of course, the Puerto Ricans out of Chicago came to Boston and found me. And so we had the FALN out of the church. Uh, and uh, it just continued to mushroom in terms of liberation causes and liberation issues. And people came together under that roof. And we began to organize and continue to organize around domestic issues, but also around international issues. Yeah. So before we go on with kind of that story, I want to um, divert a little bit and, and ask you, you know, your your encounters with policing then, if you could compare them somewhat to what we're seeing now and thought, you know, thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, there, there there's a lot of correlation. Um, because what was going on in terms of that's where they really tested uh, stop and frisk. Uh, and, and that was the jump outs. That was the jump outs before they were calling it jump outs in the black community that was taking place that was shaking down folks. And I was hit one day as I was leaving the church and going home and uh, driving along um, the street. I saw all these young men with their hands up on the wall of a building with their pants and underwear down around their ankles and a cop holding a gun and, and another cop sort of walking down, inspecting them. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and that was, you know, totally one shocking and humiliating, obviously. Uh, so that's when we began to swing into action to challenge stop and frisk. And I remember, you know, the, the, the problem in terms of getting the media to cover it. Uh, I knew a whole lot of reporters at that time in, in Boston. And I'll never forget the argument that I had with a good friend of mine. And he says, Rev, I know what's going on. He says, but I can't report it. Why can't you report it? Because if I report it, I'll never get another scoop out of City Hall or the police department. And if I can't get another scoop, I'm going to lose my job. And so that was the climate all across the city. So the cops basically 
were able to get away with what, it, what they were able to get away with because there was no public spotlight upon what they were doing. I um, called down to Atlanta and agitated with CNN. Uh, and CNN was sort of, uh, you know, in, in somewhat of its infancy stage. And I convinced them to bring a crew into Boston and that I would take them out on the streets. Uh, and I imagine we were out on the street no more than 20 minutes until we rode up on one of those scenes, which they began to film. Uh, and uh, and it was it was it was a scene out of Soweto uh, mm -hmm. because they did it. And then the cops drove away and they were hit with a barrage of bricks and bottles and cans and everything that was thrown at the cop as the cop car sped away. All of that we got on film and that went nationally. And all of a sudden it broke the story locally because now everybody had to cover it because the cat was out of the bag, so to speak. And uh, uh, so that was some of the ways in which we began to put a spotlight on the issues around stop and frisk. But one of the things is, is that in, in those departments, what was clear in Boston, and I think it's very clear today still, you have a division in terms of law enforcement who are, from the community and have an affinity for the community and law enforcement who see themselves as a force with which to keep people checked, to keep people within bounds. Uh, and so that's a part of the tension that continues to go. And that crew and that second crew, that latter one really grows out of slave catchers and all of those other types of uh, law enforcement uh, entities that existed uh, throughout our history. And so, uh, again, you know, we still are struggling with this whole issue around law enforcement and what it means uh, to be um, uh, to be engaged in a community and particularly a community of color or a poor community. Yeah, for anybody who is not familiar um, on this on this call, if you could just real quick tell us the the connection between slave catchers and and today's law enforcement. Well, well, you know, in doing pretty much doing the institution of slavery, slave catchers were the law enforcement, uh, but their job was to really make sure that those people who were traveling down roads uh, uh, had the permits of their owners on them in order to be traveling. Uh, other than that, they were runaways. And so their job was to basically track down, retain, uh, track down property that was running away, that was escaping, uh, return them to their owners, uh, basically uh, keep control over those masses, make sure they were not uprisings, make sure that they were not conspiracy. So it comes out of that kind of climate, that kind of history. Yeah, and I have to say, I'm thinking the citizenship checks in Arizona. I, I'm thinking of the Palestinian um, IDs used at the checkpoints of when in the city of Hebron, when um, yeah. numbering, when when every Palestinian that lived in that neighborhood was given a number, and only with that number could they enter um, into their neighborhood. So, so going back, um, what brought you? All oh, very. Oh, all very similar, yes. All very similar, right? All very similar. Um, so going back to 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 the story of of you know how you got here, um, what brought you to our nation's capital and the, well, the seat of the empire? <laughs> be very honest. Um, I was uh, not interested in coming to the nation's capital, uh, but. Uh, it was uh, a little bit of uh, recruitment and pushing me to apply. And so I did everything as I applied to Plymouth Church to sabotage my, my application. Uh, and uh, and, and it, it was just one of those strange things that I, I decided I was going to send in my response late so I could satisfy folks by saying, well, I got it in, but it's late. I'm sorry. Right. So I got it in late and all of a sudden they decided to accommodate the lateness of my application. And, and then I asked him that I would not come to the church unless you could deliver uh, in a congregational vote, 98% of the vote, which I didn't think they could deliver. Uh, and they shocked me and they cornered me and therefore I had to come because I, I sort of laid that out. But it was, a, it's a, it was an interesting experience coming into, um, into Washington, D.C. Um, you began to see there was the fight the naked fight in in Boston, and you began to understand that in D.C. there was a different kind of colonialism that existed, uh, that uh, 
uh, that there was there was the government and then there were neighborhoods and neighborhoods, particularly black neighborhoods, did not count and were impoverished, uh, were denied services, uh, all of those types of things that they were overrun uh, with liquor stores, for example. They were overrun with open air drug markets. They were overrun with prostitution, all those types of things. And I started taking on uh, a lot of the nightclubs and the liquor stores in the city, uh, particularly in my neighborhood. And uh, Plymouth had never done anything like that. And I remember one time people said, well, why are you doing that? And I said, well, because I live here. That's one thing. You know, I've never lived far away from my ministry. Uh, so I could always walk to my ministry. So uh, and uh, so I was always around the corner, which gives you a different kind of investment in the communities in which you serve, is that when you live there, there's a different kind of perspective that you bring. So we took it on. And I had to remind the, 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 the church one Sunday, I said, all around us, I see, I hear you all. This was in the early 90s talking about the gangs and that you don't want to go out there because of the gangs. I said, I want you to recognize that we are the gang and we're going to control our turf and we're not going to allow somebody else to control our turf. And that's what we began to do is to take on all of the issues. Uh, we, we took on a gas station across the street from the church uh, that was being built by Exxon. Yeah, not just a gas station, but a right, but a whole mega gas station. Yeah, didn't know it was Exxon at the time because nobody wanted to let the community know what was going in there. That's the kind of uh, detachment people had, particularly leaders had from the community. So we went and stood. I got a couple of guys. We went and stood in front of the bulldozer and said, we're not moving until you get whoever owns this property on the phone, and we need to find out what's going on here. So it turned out to be the Exxon Corporation headquartered in Texas, uh, and uh, we told them that we could not allow the bulldozers to move until you came and explained what was going on to this community. Uh, and they agreed. They came. We held the community meeting at the church, had a full house. Uh, and organize the neighborhood basically by asking the question in flyers, did you know? Uh, just telling the truth, not trying to just say, did you know a super gas station is going on here? Did you know the Exxon Corporation that bought this land? Those types of things. Community turned out in mass. Uh, and uh, and Exxon at that point basically set up front and told everybody what wonderful things that they were going to do, uh, that they were going to uh, 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 have a black woman franchise it thought that that would sort of appease everybody. They got that at the last minute. Uh, and I'll never forget this because it, I, to this day, I don't know who this lady is, but there was an older lady in the back of the church and she was the last one to raise her hand in that community meeting. And I called on her and she came forth with a walker. And if you can imagine, every eye fo focused on her as she slowly made her way down the aisle on this walker till she got to the microphone and she spoke in a nice Southern voice. She says, you're the Exxon Corporation. And I guess you got as much money that you can do anything you want. And you're probably gonna build that gas station because you feel that you got the power and the money to do so. And she says, and I'm a little old lady. I know I can't stop you, but at least I know how to strike matches. Mm -hmm. Mm. And the whole room went into shock, right? <laughs> and I'll never forget the expression on the guy's face from Exxon. It's like, what? Right? Did you just say you're going to burn it down? Right? Uh, anyway, so they warehouse the property for the next 10 years. Now, so, I, I know that neighborhood, and it's it's quite nice now. It's really one of my favorite neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., and I used to stay in that neighborhood and go for runs in that neighborhood in the morning. and. I want to ask you kind of the the challenge between as neighborhoods in, in Washington, D.C. or in Boston, as as communities improved them, we are now dealing uh, those neighbor, same neighborhoods are now dealing with gentrification. And yes, and, yes. and uh, I know the northeast of of Washington, D.C. is is one of those neighborhoods, you know, um, your thoughts on on that shift of uh, of the struggle. Well, it's the it's the whole issue around um, gentrification. I mean, I just finished um, giving a report to the mayor because she appointed me as the co-chair of uh, Black Homeowners Strike Force, which was to try to figure out ways in which to reverse the trend 
that is going on in D.C., which is the decline in black population and also the decline in black home ownership in Washington, D.C., because nobody can afford it. And also because basically the the children um, have such obstacles in terms of inheriting a property that it's easier to sell than to go through the rigmarole of paying the taxes on it and all this other type of stuff that kicks in once it becomes an inheritance property here. Uh, you're seeing property uh, basically uh, moving on to the market because uh, you got uh, out of town investors and out of country investors buying property uh, and uh, flipping the property that they picked up for maybe $450,000 for $1.5 million. Uh, and so they have uh, radically transforming the neighborhood. One of the things that I've argued with on the strike force, and we got to push it, is anti-flipping legislation. Oh, yeah. uh, and 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 basically, you know, everybody's afraid of messing with the market because folks sort of have been deluded into this fact that somehow the market is benevolent. Right. When the market is malevolent. And so I'm basically saying investors money that comes in the neighborhood, since you want to be focused on people being able to live in neighborhoods, if you purchase a property, that money needs to be dead for at least 48 months. That means that if you sell it, you only can mark it up maybe 10 percent. Uh, uh, there's dead money. Take away the incentive around all of this flipping and basically allows average working families to get in there and be able to compete on housing, which uh, which all the flipping has basically just artificially driven up the price anyway. Right. Uh, and so, again, it's sort of look at measures in which you slow down um, the type of of, uh, of activity that have kept working people out of the out of the market. So uh, uh, I think that's what we got to begin to deal with, because really we're going to deal with economic segregation. We're dealing with economic segregation, uh, neighborhoods and communities that are just going to be geared towards one social economic group and therefore really one race. Right. And so we got to really begin to look at it's not the issue of redlining any longer. It's the, it's the issue of being priced out of the market, which is another form of redlining. Absolutely. I mean, we go from slavery to Jim Crow to economic segregation. And, you know, the 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 issue doesn't actually go away. And and I think of this frequently as as we watch what's happening in Palestine and, and tactics, you know, shift there. And some those are some of the tactics used for Palestinian citizens of Israel. But before we get into Palestine, which I always love to talk with you about Palestinian rights, um, I know it wasn't Palestinian rights, though. FOR has a long history of working um, on Palestine. We uh, brought people there for a long time. Um, and how did you uh, come across the Fellowship of Reconciliation? Well, I've known the Fellowship of Reconciliation for quite some time when I was uh, uh, in Boston and doing the ministry there. And uh, there was a, a relationship between very often uh, groups such as the American Friends Service Committee and FOR USA. And so uh, I knew a number of people who were in a part of each one of those. And it was um, the history was something that I fully appreciated because it stretches back. Uh, I don't think we talk about the history enough, um, mm -hmm. the history of uh, what it what it means to be engaged in resistance resistance to the status quo. But um, so it goes back in time in terms of my knowledge of and and uh, in, in many ways, my relationship to uh, groups like uh, FOR USA. Yeah, well, we're so um, proud to to have you as as a supporter, as a longtime um, supporter. And for anyone who's kind of new to the Fellowship of Reconciliation, we are the uh, oldest peace and justice organization in the United States. Um, FOR started in Europe in 1914 uh, to support conscientious objectors to World War I, and then in 1915 in the United States. And um, we, we've continued to support conscientious objection. Uh, we continued through the Vietnam War, and we continue um, 
as there are conscientious objectors in Russia and Belarus and Ukraine, but we also continue as we recognize that there that this question, there are so many other ways that that we are drafted either into military service or into these systems of inequality and these systems of racism and violence that we grow up in and that um, allow these systems to continue to morph as we as we transform one thing, whether you know, when it's from ghettoization to gentrification. And so we have to, we continue to address and dissect it and conscientiously object to it. So I, I want to bring you now just to talk about Palestine and what made you decide to go there. And I've heard this story before, so I'm just going to um, let you tell it. Well, it, it, it was interesting because I was there in 1974. And I was there working as a archaeologist in 1974. And uh, and so I knew and could see the changes that were taking place back then, which was not as drastic at all as the changes that have taken place. So I did not return until 2014. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you count the years. Uh, and to go back there carrying a snapshot in my head, of 1974 versus 2014, it was like landing in a strange alien place. Uh, and, um, and you know, and one of the reasons why I was hesitant in going back, because I, I know me, I don't do junkets. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I know me that if I go somewhere and I experience it, it becomes part of my being and I can't turn it loose. Um, that's the way that's the way my my makeup is. So uh, so I was reluctant. So I went in 2014. There it was full blown. Couldn't turn it loose. Um, and so I felt as I was talking to preachers around who was still bought into this Christian Zionism because it says so in the scriptures. And there's a, a fellowship, a clergy fellowship that would not even allow me to bring up the issue. Uh, because they were so much bought into this idea of uh, Christian Zionism that it was promised in the scripture, et cetera, et cetera. I raised the money to take the preachers to Palestine. I chose the preachers from the fellowship who were Christian Zionists and said, come on. They said, I don't have the money. I said, I didn't ask you whether you have money or not. I'm paying for it. <laughs> I just, just get on the plane, right? And basically, that's how we went. And so within less than 24 hours, all of a sudden, all of these folks were reacting to what they were seeing, which was making them have flashbacks to the places that they had come out of, like Texas and Louisiana and South Carolina and Mississippi. And all of them began to testify, this is too familiar, it's too shocking, it's like I stepped back in time. And so that became the sort of the new issues that these preachers have, have picked up because they their eyes could their eyes had seen it. They couldn't touch it. And I remember one when we came back, uh, they could not keep it off the agenda any longer because I had half the fellowship that I took with me. <laughs> right, so now so now everybody actively wanted to discuss what they had seen. And I could sit back and fold my arms. And I remember somebody saying to one of the guys who was probably one of the strongest voices, um, very stubborn, which was one reason I took him. Uh, and one person began to say, well, you don't know the full story, somebody there. And this, and this preacher says, what, you trying to tell me that my eyes didn't see what my eyes saw? You can't tell me my eyes didn't see what I saw, right? And that was the end of the discussion because he had seen it. He was unwilling to intellectualize about it any longer or even do some crazy type of theology around it because he had seen it. He understood at a very visceral level of what was taking place. And therefore, he's been speaking about it and out against it since we've come back. My uh, my my colleague, Chris Smiley, colleague and friend who who's does uh, he's just come on to do it. Uh, just joining Fellowship of Reconciliation to do our social media. Uh, he was with me in Palestine when um, I was reminded of the story when you were talking about stop and frisk. And, you know, there's those moments that change you, right, that affect you in this deep level. And uh, 
Chris was there with Veterans for Peace group of, of veterans. And um, I was there staying in, in the West Bank city of Hebron. And um, my dear friend, Isa Amro, a Palestinian, had organized a demonstration for the veterans and him. And, you know, they're doing this demonstration. And when the military came, which because they do, it was the way that he sunk immediately to his knees and immediately put his head down because he knew that's I mean, that was that's just what you do to stay alive, like always. And that's the protocol. And that that, um, you know, that affected me so deeply because it was the the way in which um, that kind of violence takes your humanity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it lessens your humanity in that way, in in that forcing you to like you don't look up at the soldiers and you know he he knew how to navigate those moments of when you can push back and when you you know fall back and make sure to stay alive to continue the work. So um, from that, I, I want to ask, you know, because you you came back and you faced death threats and um, cancellations, but really death threats. That's that's what you got for for doing that work. Um, what keeps you going, whether it's domestically, you know, your work domestically or your work um, internationally, but what keeps you going? Well, I can't do anything else. <laughs> um, that's 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 the sort of the short answer of it. And I remember when I was in Hebron in 2014, um, I went into the little park in front of the synagogue there yep. uh, because I was just very curious of the setup because, you know, you got the mosque on one side and you got the synagogue on the other. And the synagogue was under military protection, so to speak. And I entered the park and there was one armored vehicle and I was a few minutes in the park and I turned around. Now there were three armored vehicles and they were looking at me and I was a lone person in the park. And so my Baltimore instincts came over and it was like, slowly walk out of this park, but slowly walk out and meet up with your folk. So I walked out and met up with my folks. By the time I got to them, a whole platoon of these young soldiers came running at us with their automatic weapons pointed at us, screaming for our papers. Right. Those papers. And, again. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember, and I didn't realize this at the time, but some of this post-traumatic stress from Baltimore kicked in. And I, and I also remembered my father who would never, ever back down under stress. And so everybody showed their papers, and now I was the only one that had not showed my papers, and my hand was on my passport in my pocket. And I remember mentally instructing my arm to move, to produce the papers, and my arm would not move. And so I finally said to them, why? Didn't want to be belligerent they had guns, right? And uh, But I needed to, I said, why? And they said, because Arabs are not allowed on this road. And so I turned my back and walked away and said, you don't need to see my papers then. And uh, there was this little rush of confusion. The rest of my delegation was frightened because of my actions. Uh, and uh, the fact is, is what I felt was that I could not surrender in that moment. I could not and would not surrender in that moment. Um, I think that's a part of who I am. Uh, you know, I mean, I was at an event at the church on Sunday and people were sort of testifying at my tenure at the church and they were talking about that I was fearless. And I began to think about that. Mm -hmm. And I had to respond to them by saying, I'm not fearless. I have great fear. Mm -hmm. But every battle I've been in, God has opened the door. God has made a way. So I've learned in this time that I just stand on the truth that I have and trust that it will work out, trust that I will find a way, trust that I will come through it, trust that I'll be able to make a stand and not falter and not fail because the spirit will see to it. But that's not fearlessness. That is basically trusting in something greater than myself. So speaking and, and trusting something greater than yourself, I know this isn't the first time that we've seen, you know, far from the first time that we've seen religion be um, twisted and, and perverted to um, 
to promote violence and to promote hatred and uh, to cause exclusion. But it's a time we're see- we're seeing it peak again publicly. And and I know, you know, I live in, like I said, I live in Ithaca, New York. And when I drive down to Washington, D.C. or to New York City, I drive through rural areas and I see Confederate flags in, in the Northeast, you know, flying proudly that weren't there 10 years ago, right? Or five years ago, they, they were not to say that the same um, racism wasn't there, but it wasn't on display like that. And as we have politicians uh, declaring themselves as Christian nationalists, and um, can you talk about this moment and the, the perversion of, of faith and, and what you see as the work? There's often been a constant struggle in faith traditions between that which is orthodox or that which basically lives in compliance and collusion with the system and with the empire, and that which struggles to promote human dignity over the empire and over the kinds of oppressive things that are carried out by institutions and structures. There's always been that response. It's a part of the what I call the Holy Spirit response. Right, that allows us to see the truth in spite of all of the narrative and all of the misinformation that goes on. I remember reading, and you can read about it, Howard Thurman writes about uh, when he was in seminary, he used to come home and read to his grandmother who was born and raised a slave. And every time that he would turn to read from Paul, she would gather herself and get up and walk away without an explanation. And so finally he asked her, he says, how come every time I read you get up and walk away and, and, and without saying a word, that's kind of rude. And she said, every Sunday, she says, the slave master's preacher would come down and read to us, and he would read the section, slaves be obedient to your masters. And she said, and I vowed if I ever got free, I wasn't going to sit still and listen to that no more. And so that was her. So she knew in her spirit that was not the word of God. She knew in her spirit that that was not the spirit of hope and liberation. And so no matter how often it was read to her, and she was supposed to be illiterate. So you got to look at what illiteracy might mean, because it surely don't mean uh, unknowing and without understanding, because she would walk away in defiance to that word. And I think that we got to realize that there is a struggle that's always afoot, and particularly has always been afoot in this country, between those who want to control things of the faith, not because they believe in things of the faith, but because they use it to try to control the narrative and, uh, and the belief system that, that, that keeps people controlled and, and, and oppresses people. Uh, so it's the use of those systems. And out of that is a great perversion of the scripture, because the scriptures uh, are, are taken out of context perverted because you don't read even the the creation of those scriptures within the context with which they were created. Uh, and, uh, and realize, I mean, I'll point out, for example, being a Christian minister, is that Christianity, what we know as Christianity, was taken over by the Orthodox Church, the Church of the Empire, but the ministry of Jesus was a ministry of poor folks, the oppressed, the left out, And it challenged the empire, uh, and it challenged the empire to such an extent that the empire killed them, right? And so, in a sense, you know, what we need to be about in very often, in most of our faith tradition, is we got to realize that we are counterculture, which means that we're revolutionary. We're counterculture to the culture that exists around us. And therefore, we have to be revolutionary and, 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 and basically create the kinds of spiritual and moral and sometimes physical uprisings within our culture. Right. Absolutely. So um, I was going to give that a follow-up question. And first I wanted to begin by saying we're supposed to end at five, but do you have another 10 minutes there or so? Sure. That- okay. and I, know, and I know some people want to ask some questions, I think. I see some in the yeah, chat. And, uh, so I want to bring on my colleague, Susan, who's going to uh, do the mm-hmm. question and answer for us today. And uh, I have some follow-up questions still, but um, 
I, I think there's a question in the chat that just is pretty much one of the things I was going to ask you. So, uh, Susan, are you? We can yes, um, we have three questions in the chat, and um, I'm going to uh, read them all, and uh, maybe you can answer each of them uh, before we go on to the new questions. The most recent question uh, is basically, um, and well, now we have two more pop up. Um, how can we, as a people of faith, show up in our, for our values as strongly as the religious right? It feels like they have co-opted the view that our culture has of Christianity. Um, and that's from uh, Twilia Slind. And then uh, two questions from earlier on, um, backtracking to when you were talking about addiction, um, uh, and that question's from me. I'm wondering, um, as we have, according by some counts, um, as much as 10% of the U.S. population addicted to uh, alcohol, uh, opiates, um, uh, you know, painkillers, uh, heroin, um, and in particular, those people who then go into clinics, methadone clinics, which is another industrial complex that is designed to keep them in place, what what do you see as the answer for people uh, uh, who are in particular addicted to opiates? And, and then, then we have a, let, let's let, let's let, let's let Gray let that yeah. too much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the one thing is that drugs do not show up in our community by accident. They are deliberately deposited within those communities. Uh, when you go back and you look at it in terms of the political struggles that were going on. In terms of the black empowerment movement, in terms of civil rights movement, it was in the aftermath, particularly around Vietnam, that drugs emerged within the community and basically began to create the kind of addiction in the community that would destroy any kind of political movement. Right. I began to understand that as we were working to pe with people in Roxbury, for example. And then I went to Mozambique. Uh, I went to Mozambique and uh, with Filimo, and there in Mozambique, every place we went, which was to document the atrocities that were being carried out by Renamo, we ended up in a village where often there were bodies still in the streets, uh, and they would come in and they would take the men, the young men, and have them take drugs, and then out of those drugs, kill their families so that they could never be repatriated to their families. And so now they were part of a military unit, which was the only family they had left. And that created someone to lay. And so I began to realize that, hold it, this, yes, is a health issue, and it's a mental health issue, but it's also a political issue. That's right. right. It's all linked together in terms of the disempowerment of a community. I think that what we need to do is really, if we really want to deal with it, we got to talk about people having the ability to get treatment on demand. You know, at when they need to get off the streets and get into treatment, there should be places that will absorb them into treatment so that they can get clean. It goes back to the Tony, like the story about Tony Ruiz, which was the guy that shot up dope in the church. Right. Fact is, we got him off the street and he changed his life and he died from cancers, from pan pancreatic cancer sometime later. And I went to see him and I'll never forget this. I said, Tony, I said, you know, they say you're going to die. He says, it's OK. He says, it's OK. I said, what, what do you want me to say at your eulogy? He says, I don't care what you say other than this. You tell them I died clean. And that's what I did. I told everybody he died clean because he even refused to accept uh, any painkiller at the end uh, because that was his testimony. Again, those are the types of things that we need to really look at right now. I'm, I'm wrestling because somebody's wanting me to come out against the decriminalization of drugs. And in part, I agree with that. But then there's another part of that where I know that the community is already disrupted, disrupted by the presence of drugs in, in our community. I don't want to see people go to jail, but there has to be treatment that is available for folks and not prisons and not jails. And I think we're talking about health care here, yeah. right? We're and, talking about what our priorities are as a country and what we fund and and who has access to health care. But I want to bring you back to um, the question that that just speaks to the work that FOR is, is trying to do right now. And Susan, could you read um, that question again about uh, from Twilla? 
Yes, uh, from Twila, how can we as people of faith show up for our values as strongly as the religious right? And it feels like they have co-opted the view that our culture has of Christianity. I think that one of the things, if you're not in a house of faith, you need to get in there. And from the inside, you need to be willing to disrupt and hold the clergy accountable and push the clergy to do the kinds of progressive things in the neighborhood, in the community, wherever they exist. Because I think that a lot of us on the sort of a liberal or, or political left, we like to feel good because we think that we think in the right ways. But we don't do anything in order to advance that agenda. And to, in a, in, a, in a major way, to look at our own faith institutions as being a political entity. We have refused to make it a political entity. I went to a meeting just this past week, and there was somebody sitting there talking about, well, you know, um, um, <clears throat> when, when we're in the church, we can't uh, 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 support a candidate. Uh, we can't tell people who to vote for and what not to vote for. And, and, and I'm sitting there going, since when? Right. The right wing has always done that. That's right. They have always carried out that agenda. Right. From the time when they put out their playbooks on who to vote for and who not to vote for and those who so-called represent their conservative agenda and who don't accept uh, or represent their conservative agenda, they're telling people who to vote for. And we have begun, we, we, we bought into sort of the liberal paradigm of this small D democracy uh, that we can't tell folks that everybody should be able to think what they want to think and have, you know, I mean, I, 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 I tell folks that unless you vote sometimes this way, you're not a Christian at all. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it's just like if you, if you, if you vote against same gender marriage, you're not a part of the team that Jesus is on. If you, you know, if you, if you vote, you no, know, not, not to, uh, 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 if you vote against immigrants, you're not on the same team that Jesus is on, right? <laughs> on down the line, if you vote again for those who do not embody racial justice and hope, then you're not on the same team. And I'm salvation cannot be offered to you. Absolutely. So along those lines, I want to ask you um, about some work that that we're starting to do together, but that you initiated um, around white supremacy in churches. And uh, if you could talk about that um, briefly, because it's the same question, right? Like, sure. is it acceptable to just to just uh, everybody gets to be who they are? And, and if you're just being a racist, then that's that freedom. I, w I was floating down in a little part of rural Northern Virginia, and there was a uh, UCC congregation in this town that had a uh, big Black Lives Matter banner in the yard, which is good, is great. But they were across the street from a building that was wrapped in a banner that said, this is mega country and uh, immigrants are not allowed. And it went on down like that. So the folks, so I immediately thought, these folks in this church, they feel good about themselves that they got a Black Lives Matter banner on their church. But at the same time, they have not challenged the community around them to create the kind of tension and the kind of disruption that is going to drive white supremacy back into the woodwork. Uh, in other words, it's allowed to exist. And when we look at it, all the stuff that's going on around us, even though we may think in proper ways, we may not have a racist bone in our body. So we tell ourselves uh, so, that, you know, all, all of that type of all of that type of stuff. But but, you know, but just think about the people that we're friends with who got different points of view. And not just different points of view, but hateful points of view. Uh, we've allowed that kind of, uh, 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 of, of place to be. And so we've given aid and comfort to a spirit of, uh, of hatred, a spirit of xenophobia, phobism, uh, a spirit that is intolerable. And therefore, you know, we're called in a sense, I think, to span, stand up and speak out. That's not a black person's problem. That's a white community's problem. Absolutely. The white community has got to challenge the white community has got to tell the white community, I'm not interested in your dinner party. 
I'm not interested in your country club. I'm not interested in us continuing as friends because I have a set of values here that you have violated. I think we got to be able to say that and willing to say that and willing, in a sense, to stake out the position so that we're not trying to be friends with everybody. And that, that's a bit of why I'm so proud to say I was part of the Jewish community that supported you after you got back from Palestine, because it's a Jewish problem when somebody comes back from Palestine to work for human rights and they get death threats. That's a, that's largely a Jewish problem. Um, but if you could talk about, uh, yeah, I, I, I read a newspaper article on on um, the work you've been doing in the United Church of Christ around this. We wrote we wrote uh, a, a resolution that went before the association and the conference here that basically called upon white churches to, to declare themselves as a white supremacy free zone and that they would put outside of their churches statements of that effect uh, that would really challenge uh, the community around them. Now, it was interesting to hear the pushback in the debate uh, because some people didn't know how to push back. Or, and wanted to try not to be seen as uh, uh, being racist and pushing back. But the comments were interesting, like, oh, if we put that, if we put a banner up, somebody might set fire to our church. Well, that happens all the time in the black community. Uh, we may, we don't feel safe any longer. Well, that's the same thing in the black community. Well, we tell everybody that you're welcome here. And now we're saying you're not welcome here. Well, not quite. You're saying white supremacists are not welcomed here. <laughs> There's a difference, right? Unless you have been welcoming of white supremacy, which goes back to my previous point, is that we have been comfortable with everybody that we've given aid and comfort to the most reprehensible attitudes that exist. It passed overwhelmingly in the association, in the conference, and it also passed in uh, Southern California, Nevada conference of the United Church of Christ. And now it's going before the national church uh, and we'll see how well it, it fares there. Uh, so uh, um, so it's, it's, it's pushing the church. Uh, uh, one of the things that people automatically said, which was interesting was that the resolution was too provocative. Uh, it, it, it upset people. And, and, and that's a part of this work. This work has to upset people if it's gonna make a difference. Absolutely. And, you know, Fellowship of Reconciliation, we were we were heavily involved in the civil rights movement. We like to take a lot of pride in um, the fact that Martin Luther King belonged to uh, two organizations in his lifetime. He lent his name to two organizations and FOR is one. And we are also a historically uh, white organization. And and this is our work and our challenge to to um, make our spaces free of white supremacy and Christian nationalism and um, for me, Jewish supremacy and, and so much more. Uh, Susan, do we have another question? Yeah, we have, we have a couple questions. Just to backtrack to earlier in the conversation, um, Bill Schur from Unearthed Peace, uh, which is uh, headquartered in Maryland, he was asking for a clarification on the distinction uh, what was the problem with the gas station, that it was cloaked in secrecy or the the, the Exxon station itself? So that was one question. And then uh, we have from Packy Wheeland from Code Pink. She's wondering um, if you see uh, the Poor People's Campaign as a way forward. Very good. Well, I mean, the, the issue with the gas station was uh, based on a number of things. One, we were existing in a colonialized context where we didn't have the right of representation or we don't have the right of representation in Washington, D.C. Uh, we don't have a vote in Congress. Uh, and basically how mayor and city council can be taken over at any time by the Congress, which it did the next when, when Barry was last elected mayor uh, because they were offended at that and stepped in and uh, took over the city. And, and that's when gentrification really did happen in Washington, D.C., when Congress took over and the control board was put in place. So the issue was not only the gas station, but the fact that the community had no autonomy, had no voice. And therefore, uh, we needed to make sure that everybody who came into this neighborhood had to really uh, submit 
to the voices and the wishes of this community in order to exist here. It was the same thing we did with the liquor stores. It was the same things we did with the nightclubs. Um, uh, we had to take them on one by one. Uh, we, we, we had one store open up. We asked them to, for example, uh, to sign an agreement that they would not sell liquor. They signed an agreement with us. Within six months, they had applied for a liquor license and uh, they got it. And we put a picket line on their store that afternoon, and we kept that picket line going for a year until we bankrupt that store. And everybody said, well, why were you going to bankrupt them? I said, because the issue is, is community integrity. They did not respect the community. And now, in a sense, we have to take them, make an example of them so that everybody understands what it means when you don't respect the community. Absolutely. So... Um... I want to ask one more question myself, and then I'm going to ask if you will uh, sign us off with a prayer. Um, just give us a little bit of, of that prophetic voice that, that you so much have. But um, I want to ask what you see in, in this current uh, moment, um, in this current climate as we head into the November election and as <clears throat> so much, you know, what you see as um the Fellowship of Reconciliation's role and um, kind of your your thoughts for for us as we move forward. Yeah, we're 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 in a dangerous, very dangerous place. Um, and to my mind, the Democrats don't get it and don't understand it. Uh, and of course, the so-called Republican Party is so. Uh, racist extremists that I cannot uh, even look in their direction. Um, the, uh, you know, the the Republicans have played towards the fear, white fear in this country. And they have been successful in playing towards white fear in this country, talking about things like replacement theory uh, and uh, and basically being overrun by the global South that will displace American culture and white civilization. Uh, all of those types of things. They have spread that successfully, uh, that type of fear. You know, I think our job as FOR and as people of conscience, good conscience and faith, is that we have to paint a vision as well uh, in a, a, a very passionate way. Instead of building upon fear, we need to find ways to build upon hope. Uh, and that that hopefulness uh, needs to talk about what the country can be, what it can look like, how we get there. We're not going to get there on one issue or on two issues, but we get there in terms of painting a tapestry that people can look at and see themselves in and find their hopefulness in. You know, the 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 issue is uh, I was I was sharing this earlier, and Jindel, some of you remember him out of Louisiana. Uh, he was doing a response to one of the presidential State of the Union. I think it was Obama's State of the Union. And he made this statement, which caught my attention. I hadn't seen nobody pick it up since, but it caught my attention. He says, the Democrats want you to think that we are a country of have and have nots. We Republicans believe that we are a country of haves and those who hope to have. <laughs> That's enough for most people. That's right. The fact that they hope to have, right, wealth, that they hope to have all of this stuff that's so-called a part of the American dream. And we've talked about, in a sense, less rather than more. We've talked about all these things that have sort of diminished the hopefulness of people. Uh, and I think that we got to sort of begin to advance the hopefulness of people. Uh, and, 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 and we got to do it with a great and tenacious spirit and got to be able to crystallize it and preach it. So I see we have one more question that I'll let Susan ask, and then I'm asking if you can close this out with a prayer. Uh, Reverend Graylin, this comes from Ethan Vesley Flad, FOR's Director of National Organizing. He asks, in the work of disrupting white supremacy, how do you manage the balance and tension of the work of resistance slash revolutionary liberation with reconciliation slash constructive engagement with those who are agents of structural violence, i.e. the police. And I just want to add to that, if you can also um, tell us a bit about faith strategies, your organization. Sure, sure. And I mean, I think that part of it is, is that as we do the work, 
if we're doing the right work, then we call people to convert. We call people to choose where they stand, where, where their values lie, where their hopefulness lie. I was going back and I was looking, for example, at all of these websites that were dealing with black uh, patrolmen's associations. And all of them ironically talked about justice and community relationships in, 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 in their, on their website, even though maybe none of them are living up to it. But the reality is there's something there that they want to have broken open. Maybe it's just words, but at least words, you get something that you can begin to attack and you begin to force back on people to address. I think that uh, part of what we, 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 we got to be doing is, yes, the resistance, but we also give space for people, in a sense, to come back uh, and to the place where they should be and join in the work. But I don't think we wait for everybody to get there. We don't even wait for one person to get there. We do what we're called to do, whether the weather is right or whether the weather is wrong. Uh, and uh, uh, we, 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 we do it day in and day out, and that's what causes people to come around and to respond. Uh, because the issue of justice, the issues of justice that we're faced with are not something that's defined by polls. It's defined by a sense of worth and a, a, a sense of values and, um, and our own sense of existentialism. Yeah, so uh, if you could tell us a little bit about faith strategies, I know we've gone. Yes. Faith strategies. Time. If you can tell us a little bit about faith strategies, and I put a link to it in the chat, and I also put a link to Graylin's Twitter handle, at Graylin Hagler, and sure. um, look for him on Facebook as well. Faith strategy came about because we, 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 we looked at a lot of the movements, the social movements, unions, and all of that, that always came and looked for clergy in times of trouble. And we're saying, hold it, hold it. We, you know, we're not, we're not preachers that you call on like that. We're, we're, we're not the driving window at McDonald's. Uh, and we are thinking about issues and working on issues every single day, just trying to address sometimes the people in our congregations. And therefore, you know, the, you, you need to treat us, this collective of clergy, as people who have been around and people who know about the political struggle and can bring also the kinds of theological reflection and value to the work. Uh, and on many occasions, we had to teach people how to begin to talk to faith communities, how to have the proper faith language to communicate, to be able to move their causes forward and through uh, faith institutions. And so we did that, and we've been doing that uh, for quite some time and working with labor unions, working around one fair wage, working around uh, uh, many uh, different issues uh, in this city. We, 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 and not only in the city, but in the whole, across the country and in the metropolitan area. I mean, we raised, for example, uh, the the minimum. Well, if I can say this real quick, we got engaged with a battle when Walmart tried to come in that was called the uh, Large Retailer Accountability Act, which was to force these big box stores like Walmart to pay a livable wage. And we won that vote uh, at the council, but we did not win uh, the kind of margin that was uh, that was veto proof. And so uh, the mayor vetoed it and which caused a big uproar because everybody in the city was in favor of it because we had done the kind of public relations job that we that we should have done. Uh, so even though he vetoed it, he had to come out with a very robust raise the minimum wage campaign in order to try to get political cover. And uh, and so that's why uh, the uh, minimum wage continues to go up every year here in D.C. is because of that battle over the Large Retail Accountability Act. So sometimes you end up with more than you want by focused upon the things that you want. Now, I was muted. Absolutely. So many of us on this call are people of various faiths um, right here in the uh Talking right now, we have three different faiths, but if you would close us out with. Um, with sure. A and one of the things that I always remember is as we have people from different faith perspectives and different understanding of faith 
And it may not be in the traditional ways that many of us think about faith and spirituality, but it's all, it should all unite us together as one people. And so we pray in a spirit of justice, which is a meditation in the spirit of hope and justice to be guided, to be lifted, to be embraced to be able to go forth and do all that we have been called to do, to touch humanity, to feel our own spirits touched and lifted and moved, that we feel the enlargement of what we are about and what we care about, and that we might share that spirit and that passion with others, that joy with others, until we as one people, united under many different names, can change the world. And all these things we offer up our hopes. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for joining us. And I know we're all saying amen. Um, and let's go forward and, and do the work. Amen. Thank you to everyone. Bless you.